uh, Professor Doyle Young here. Uh, I'm delighted to meet you via the internet and uh, these video technologies. Uh, we are taping this from uh, California, the United States, and uh, we are into actually the first uh, <coughs> section uh, of our uh, leadership class uh, that we are characterizing as leadership and change. Uh, for those of you uh, using the text, you will find that uh, that would appear in uh, chapter 13. However, what we're doing um, is we're taking uh, essentially chapter 13 and we're putting it up front as the sort of initial piece or the content for uh, the lectures. Uh, so what you will be getting <coughs> actually uh, in this initial uh, content area of this lecture will be uh, refresh and uh, off the sh off, uh, just off the press, if you will, research that's being conducted in this whole area of what uh, we would characterize as the ever-changing organization. <clears throat> so if you were to put a subtitle to uh, this particular initial lecture, it might be uh, how leaders create the capacity for continuous change, learning, and improvement. So with that, we'll, we'll get started. The research sites that came out of the research for this area includes uh, the vast body of leadership knowledge on change leadership uh, uh, and also uh, research into actual practices directly by the researchers into uh, worldwide organizations uh, and they run uh, over 1,400 1, organizations worldwide. Uh, such organizations uh, that we know here in the West, for example, as um, Starbucks, uh, Applied Materials, a worldwide manufacturer of uh, uh, computer uh, equipment, um, Knight Ritter uh, uh, publishing firms, uh, Philips uh, UK, uh, uh, AT&T, uh, The Gap, uh, Samsung, um, uh, the U.S. Navy, Xerox, uh, Price Waterhouse Europe, um, Ford Motor Car Company, Levi Strauss, uh, Teledyne Controls, uh, N.V. Phillips Corporation, and many others. So let's uh, let's posit at the beginning of the lecture what the an organizational dilemma, the organizations today's organizational dilemma. This came out of Newsblaze. Uh, a magazine in 2006, and it's a quote, over 64% of C-level executives from 250 mid-sized to large companies in the United States and the European Union have said that being able to execute, to react quickly to changing business opportunities and te technologies is critical to their success. And nearly 80% of them, of these 250 mid-sized to large companies, said that it's nearly impossible for them to achieve that success or execution given the rate of change in the world today. So we are in a world uh, that by inference here is uh, a world class, we're into a world global uh, class organizations. Every organization of literally almost any size is now uh, competing in the global stage. And that global stage is being increasingly subjected to what I would characterize as hyper change. Uh, that is, change is coming faster and faster and is being driven by a, a large number of forces. Uh, and we're going to be talking about those shortly. But the key to change today as it impacts leadership is, is what, uh, what I would characterize as execution performance. How do you execute? your plans successfully in a world that is changing so quickly that by the time you get your plans done, uh, it's, uh, your ground is already shifting underneath you. So some of the recent, most recent research uh, and uh, anecdotal information coming out of uh, uh, worldwide executives is their statements that even the most traditional and successful of approaches to strategic planning uh, are being questioned because of the time it takes and time here is a critical resource 
uh, to vet those plans, um, that the assumptions being made and even the uh, plans uh, deliverables or outcomes are being uh, seen as maybe not valid anymore. So the key factor we know to achieving execution performance as leaders is getting uh, your employees 100% behind your corporate strategy and those plans. I mean, shall we say it again, that execution of plans is absolutely, fundamentally, importantly dependent on um, the employees, shareholders, stakeholders getting behind those plans. So to uh, achieve a critical performance in execution, uh, you have to form the basis of commitment. Leaders have to form the basis of commitment to convert their strategy into action. So uh, as the organizational requirements, if we were to take a look at this at a very high level, what are the three factors that, that have a significant play in terms of characterizing or looking at uh, how we uh, involve as leaders, employees, and organizations uh, undergoing change? And when I say organizations undergoing change, that change can be from change in a world of, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, low uncertainty where there's not a lot of change going on, to environments, external environments driven that are driving high uncertainty for organizations, uh, whatever they are in terms of that an organization sits along that sort of Likert scaling from low to high uncertainty, all those organizations are dealing with change. So how do we, within that context, get employees involved and committed to strategy and plans? And how we do that as leaders forms the basis of commitment to convert strategy into action. Let me say that again. How we, as leaders, or leaders of those organizations, get uh, people involved and committed to strategy and plans forms the basis of commitment to convert strategy into action, convert strategy into implement implementable plans that have a high probability of being executed. Okay, So the three areas um, that you'll see up on the chart are strategy, execution, and engagement. So we recognize that just having strategy alone is not, is not paramount. Uh, you must have a plan, if you will, that has a very high probability of being successfully executed down to the details necessary to move those plans uh, uh, into the marketplace or uh, into uh, the audiences that we're responsible for uh, our mission. Uh, and then uh, the, the confluence between strategy and execution has to be our employees, how we engage those employees. And again, earlier I said we need to get 100% commitment from our employees to be able to do that. If you look at all of this and the overlap of all three of these areas, at the heart of it sits performance. And that performance is both at an organizational level and an individual contributor level, whether it's a frontline worker, uh, whether it's a supervisor or manager or leader at any level, it's really about performance. Ultimately, what we're talking about is by maximizing the contribution as, as leaders through engagement, we are increasing uh, uh, organizational capabilities. Leaders are increasing their, the capacity of that organization uh, through in, uh, creating a workforce uh, environments, uh, productive work environments that increase organizational cap capabilities. By so doing, we increase the execution capability, what I call execution excellence, the, uh, the ability of the organization to perform against the plan set for it. And when we do these things and create the momentum that we need to, we're thereby creating uh, sort of some measures. We look to create a positive uh, performance and measures. It might be market share in this case, might be revenue growth and even profitability. That model can be applicable to just about any organization uh, as, we, uh, as we superimpose importance of laying over strategy with uh, engagement and execution. Now what we have found in working with lots of leaders over the years and the research has shown that today because of this rapid change in organization, leaders are coming to face an issue that strategic planning can no longer just be a corporate exercise. That when they plan, 
they need to create a link between the plan and the operational implementation. Uh, we use a fancy word within leadership called action planning. Uh, that once the higher level objectives and strategies are vetted uh, out of the mission and vision and values that the organization moves quickly into delineating uh, what are the implementation steps, the action steps to create accountability within the organization. So appropriate goals and milestones are established and that as they go through this process on a regular basis, maybe not even a yearly basis, but in a quarterly basis, they look to reinvent those plans and make them highly competitive by inno being innovative and creative. So the challenge for the leaders in the world of hyperchange is to create this linkage, this alignment with the outside world and the inside world where those functional plans are synchronized for people. So, and we know further that effective communication throughout the organization makes this, makes this happen. One of the areas that uh, research has uncovered uh, in this world of how uh, leaders can create environments uh, to use change as a competitive weapon, how they use change as a means of creating uh, distinctive competencies within the organization or areas that they can do very well. For example, it might be for Apple coming out with uh, innovating the iPod. In the 1990s, I happen to be a consultant to, to Apple and be one of the first people about 1996 or 97 to be, uh, to be, I was under contract with them to see the iPod before it even came out. And when I saw this uh, piece of equipment, I said to myself, um, when I was told it would hold 10,000 songs, my first reaction was, uh, yes, when pigs fly. I didn't say that to them, but I was in, frankly, a state of cognitive dissonance. It's just very hard to believe that this very small cigarette-sized package would hold that many songs. And so, you know, there are organizations that are really building environments like Apple that um, bring in the very best talent and have a way of communicating and being innovative. Well, out of, out of researching organizations like this and others, we found out that there are primarily three methods that organizations or leaders gather data. Uh, one is structured data, that is, uh, they, they gather database information that's easily accessible to them. Uh, this is, you know, databases that are either online or, you know, uh, computer-based, or they might be print-based. But they have database information that's available to them. These are standard reports that executives or leaders get, you know, performance, uh, financial objectives, operating, exec uh, object, uh, uh, operating data, and so forth. That's one source of data. Second is unstructured data. These are files and documents and PDF file and notes and emails and PowerPoints and so forth. This is unstructured data that's typically, uh, I, would, I would characterize it as uh, known but unstructured. Uh, and when I was talking about the structured data, that's known too. So it's known structured and then there's unstructured data which is known. But there is actually a third area that executives use that is a uh, not as explicit area of information, and that is called tacit information. Uh, it is important information, and that is what is essentially locked away in the hearts and minds of employees. And that represents, by the research, 40 to 60 percent of all information. So it's, uh, I would characterize it as the attitudes and perceptions and organizational knowledge and relationships that people have, and another way we characterize that is the grapevine. You know, what that, what's those communications that go around with people and what under the certain conditions would people really tell you if they realize their job was not on the line, but if they could be really candid with you about how they see the organization and their areas of improvement, see? So, uh, just to reiterate, in order to improve execution capability of organizations, it's really, really incumbent upon us in order for leaders as they work within the organization to pull information uh, from as many sources as they can and they use that information as a, as, as a basis to diagnose the organization's uh, uh, change gaps, if you will, or strategic gaps or operational gaps. That is, those issues associated with the organization to achieve execution capability. So if you're following me, the issue today is not so much that organizations have plans, that is an absolute requirement, a plan, however you want to characterize it, a business plan or a strategy, that's not the issue anymore. Because uh, organizations today are really very, very good at that. And, and organizations that don't have that, 
they are really, frankly, at a disadvantage to start. Uh, second is we've we're learned from this research is the real issue because of hyper change in the world today, which we're going to talk more and more about, uh, and the elements associated with that environmentally that impact organizations. What they really are dealing with is how to execute against their strategy. Okay, and to make things executable today, they have to they the leadership have to engage workers in a more significant positive way than they've ever had to before because they can't afford not to have the critical data that they need in order to make decisions therefrom and problem solve. And you know, if, if the question may become for leaders is in a what context would leaders or for, for, for followers, those within the organization to have a candid conversation that, that where they knew there wouldn't be any reprisal. So with that, you know, organizations today are faced with the daunting challenge of putting together and designing solutions to move the organization into what uh, the research has characterized a change-seeking mode, okay? So it is executing solutions linked to the strategic vision and key strategic objectives in which the action plans and performance indicators will measure results productively. What you have in front of you now is uh, what I would characterize as the planning waterfall. Uh, it is a, a way of just sort of characterizing what goes on uh, every day in organizations uh, and in terms of their planning and how they are operating. Uh, and you know, most organizations all start with a mission and vision and values uh, that forms the basis in their deliberations for uh, how they discharge their responsibilities. Uh, the vision of a founder, let's say, uh, about you know, what do they want that organization to accomplish and the values that they operate in. So we're going to be talking about these a little bit more during the semester. You know, what are values um, and so forth. And they, they convert those into strategies. And then we have a set of core competencies within that organization. Those core competencies uh, might be such things as like with Toyota, their manufacturing capability. Uh, for Apple, it's their um, innovative uh, products that are linked to actual um, popularity in the marketplace with a very popular brand. Uh, for um, manufacturing companies, uh, for example, that, that produce uh, computers like Dell, it's uh, customer, it has been uh, uh, performance uh, for value for computers. Um, still others have other different kinds of competencies. So these competencies give them an edge, if you will, in terms of their brand and can form key strategic initiatives uh, in their marketplaces. Typically, um, an organization's capability, its core competencies, are the change drivers that move it into the marketplace successfully because of the brand and the popularity and people's uh, experience with that brand. Um, there's a performance dimensions that come under, under that, and these uh, will be talked about in a few minutes, and we're called those eight performance dimensions well, under change leadership for organizations within the change area. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you'll see just examples of some of the areas uh, that organizations are dealing with as a result of how they translate those strategies into action plans and uh, various initiatives, the performance indicators, color, cultures, processes, st structures, and skills and rewards. Okay. So what we're bringing up here for, ch for change leaders is the, is this the whole concept of the, the ever-changing organization. And that ever-changing organization for leaders is really an important uh, goal for them to be creating organizations that are responding to uh, the marketplace needs for a particular set of products and services. But an ever-changing organization is a concept, is a concept of an organization that is skilled at creating, acquiring, and transferring knowledge at the individual, team, process, and organizational level. The, the key there, as Peter Drucker says, it, it's a knowledge organization. That a knowledge organization, its success is built on the knowledge worker, those people with the requisite skills and competencies to discharge their responsibility in the workplace for whatever jobs that they have. So the organization, community, by a range or collective collectivism, if you will, for lots of individuals, is able to acquire this information to create it and transfer it throughout the organization and share it. We, we have historically, we have about 30 years now uh, in the United States 
and worldwide of calling these corporate universities, uh, our learning centers, uh, enterprises in which the, you know, the ability to archive and access information and get them out to individuals very quickly in terms of skills and competencies and knowledge and tools is really critical. Now, having said this, an ever-changing organization within leadership practices, again, provides an integrated or systems approach dedicated to developing both the organization and individuals to achieve their respective goals. So what does that mean? That means that uh, the organization we know today is a living system. Uh, much like each of us as human beings uh, are uh, the embodiment of a living system with parts uh, and, and uh, self-perpetuating self in many, many regards. Well, organizations are living systems too. They have moving parts. And we are learning more and more about these moving parts and how to address holistically and, uh, the issues, uh, uh, the different parts of that organization that can bring it to life. And so uh, leaders within organizations, in, in terms of understanding the complexity of those organizations, are becoming more challenged to address the complexity of the organization as, as, as never before. So with leaders, you know, what's the purpose of all of this? Is that we believe that, that uh, the research is showing that uh, leaders who build organizations with the capacity to use change as a weapon, leaders that are dedicated to building sustainable competitive uh, value uh, within those organizations and the markets or the uh, customers that they're serving, um, are, are able by doing this well to respond to more, more effectively to new opportunities, to changing customer requirements, to new technologies, uh, to a changing set of an external environments that are, as we know, highly fluid today, to competitive situations, and increasingly to the globalization of business and markets. Uh, the next slide characterizes and shows some of the research with regard to uh, the external environment and the impact of, um, of 10 particular areas that um, came out of the, has come out of the research um, uh, worldwide. And this research, again, is not only in the research that was conducted uh, independently by me and others uh, directly with organizations, but it's also come out of the li literature, classic, classic literature, the academic literature for, uh, <coughs> for uh, this whole question of uh, managing for change or creating an uh, a ever-changing organization. Again, the environment, let's go back and sort of characterize what does it mean by environment. Environment are those external uh, influences on an organization which it has no control over, but it has to, but needs to recognize classically in terms of planning as an opportunity and threat. And so before you, you see 10 of those. And I don't want to go through all of them in, in great detail because that's not necessarily the topic of this lecture. Uh, but some of those will be fairly straightforward to you. Uh, we might, um, mention a, might mention several. One of those is the rate of technology change. For example, the half-life of a software engineer in the world today is four years. That means half of everything they know in four years is defunct. So they have to be constantly committed to learning the technologies as these are shifting. I mean, it wasn't just a few years ago that the Sony um, Walkman was very popular and they lost that market for the most part with the iPod when it came out. And that was just a period of just a few years. We're seeing the advances in uh, computer storage, computer software, um, speed of uh, accessing data, uh, security issues worldwide, on and on and on. That, that change is actually speeding up. Um, <clears throat> access to information is obviously critical. And uh, today we're seeing the environmental impact of business in terms of uh, uh, the initiatives worldwide to reduce the carbon emissions. So we're, we're seeing a huge impact on organizations that, that need to be good, faithful stewards of this information in, in terms of their planning and, and what goes on in the organization. So we can't dismiss too lightly uh, all of these areas and others that I didn't mention in terms of their impact on the organization and the importance of leaders to create conditions that, that get information about this, that create mechanisms within the organization to respond to this, these environments. 
Now, I've thought with others about how to characterize an organization's uh, orientation to change, if you will. Uh, and um, uh, me and my colleagues have come up with a uh, scaling uh, which is, uh, you'll see this called an organization's external environment. So if we were to take those factors, as an example, the 10 that you saw on the slide there, we could literally say if you were going to take a snapshot of your organization or organizations that you worked in, uh, you could literally uh, take and survey, for example, everybody in your company and come out with their reaction of how well the organization has responded uh, to those changes and you could literally plot based on the input from employees, shareholders, stakeholders. You could provide input by actually quantified data, actual have performance of the organization. And you could literally sit on there uh, taking a look from inside to outside organizations, that external environment, okay? That external environment will be uh, from what we call Likert scaling from low to high uncertainty, okay? So if you are a government worker, working uh, in a government agency, you may actually be experiencing a low level of uncertainty. If you're in the postal system in the United States, um, you know, you're in an organization that is very large, very cumbersome, uh, and is dealing with uh, a fair amount of low uncertainty. Though that is even changing now with worldwide uh, distribution of packages to UPS, to FedEx, and so forth, that there is competition that's being, uh, being increased for uh, some of these organizations that are very slow and cumbersome. <clears throat> the low uncertainty might be the steel industry <laughs> that we see worldwide, even though now that is speeding up uh, with the uh, fact that you can uh, buy steel cheaper overseas <coughs> than, you can, than you can produce it inside. Now there are organizations at the other end of that that have high, high uncertainty. These are organizations that live within the context of a tremendous amount of change or hyper change within the world. Typically over here you have uh, technology organizations. Now, so we could plot any organization literally from this external environment. Now, likewise, as we sit in organizations and we look to the outside at the external environment, um, it's important for us uh, to recognize that leaders are responsible for looking inside the organization and assessing the organization's uh, capacity, is probably a good word, of responding to the external environment, by the demands placed, for example, by government regulations, by the demands placed by technology shifts, by the demands placed by competition, by the demands placed uh, from our accountability as stewards of the resources that were given in an organization. <coughs> so having said that, how do we respond? And so you'll see this other scaling there called an organization's internal environment. That is, you can literally take, again, <clears throat> that organization that we were talking about earlier, which an individual is sort of assessing as a leader of the organization, you could literally take a plot from what we call change averse to change seeking, uh, that organization there. And here, here is the real key. We've heard the word alignment a lot in organizations. We want to align the organization. Well, this may very well be the most critical of alignments that happens as we build agile competitive organizations and how they uh, align, they, the leaders, the organization uh, from the external environment to the organization's capacity to respond to that environment. Now the way they respond and how they build capacity to respond, if you will, uh, we, could, we could plot from change averse again to change seeking. So change seeking organizations are building cultures where change is used as a weapon, where they, where they welcome change, where they seek out change, uh, where they're monitoring change, and they're looking for opportunities there to build products and services that may actually even be ahead of the curve of change. Intel, a major, of course, a microprocessor produced in the United States, has been using technology and, and, and uh, laws, if you will, of thermodynamics, not thermodynamics, but computer manufacturing to build generations of, of chips that are ahead of the curve. <clears throat> Those chips have been used in cell phones and a lot of other technologies, uh, applications. So wherever the organization sits relative to that internal environment, relative to the external environment, actually will define the capacity 
of that organization. Let's take uh, a situation where you have an organization under high uncertainty. I gave the example earlier of Toyota, which is very fresh, and Toyota is coming under a lot of criticism in the United States uh, for not responding fast enough, if you will, to, um, <coughs> to um, the, what is perceived to be manufacturing flaws in the braking systems. And uh, as of just recently, um, you know, Toyota came out and said, we really think we understand what the problem is, we're going to do the recalls. When just in the last few days, there's been a lot more information coming out suggesting that, that the problem that they identified is not the real problem. So in that situation there, you have now uh, a very a situation of extreme high uncertainty for Toyota because they're losing, they will, they will lose, they are starting to lose significant market share uh, in the United States. Uh, they have to have an organization, an environment that's what? Uh, just don't care? Uh, just saying we're going to continue doing what we're doing here? Or do they have to be an environment and a culture that's speeding up its ability to respond to the pressures on the outside and actually be friendly in seeking those? <coughs> The Toyota culture has been characterized as slow and ponderous in which the issues with this braking, for example, have been going on for years and Toyota has, has not been responsive to the customer demands and requirements, which actually is one of the external uh, environmental impacts on organizations today. So I think you see what we're saying here is the alignment is very critical. <clears throat> and so for an organization to be moving into a highly competitive posture, it needs to have a culture of uh, people committed, both in terms of skills and talents through their leadership, to align that culture in a number of different ways to respond uh, to that changing environment. <clears throat> now you'll see uh, in the definitions uh, for the purpose of the lecture, I've given you a series of definitions, uh, and you can read those, change a verse. Uh, Again, we're back to the Likert scaling, um, change resistant, uh, change managing. And by the way, this particular scaling on change management has been pretty much where the prevailing literature worldwide sits that we've been able to find related to how do you deal with change. And so the, the, actually the material, the academic materials refer to a lot as change managing. So we, we think that that literature in terms of our own research needs to go a little bit further. Uh, but we've provided some characteristics of change managing, uh, change friendly, you'll see the definition there, and for change seeking. <clears throat> for the change seeking, again, uh, those organizations and the leaders there value change and fear the failure to change. They have continued improvement and learning. It's integrated into the culture and the processes. There is a commitment to lifelong learning for individuals and organizations supported financially and in policies and procedures. The, their customer focus is an absolute obsession with those organizations. Uh, competitive intelligence is pursued aggressively. Uh, technology changes are assessed continuously. Uh, proactively, they define the competitive agenda and strive to define customer needs ahead of the competition. Uh, they always view employees as assets. Uh, their vision and values are well understood. They're embraced and followed. And their leaders within those organizations uh, are modeling effective uh, those values effectively in terms of their leadership and management practices. So you can see my point in just going through this, you can go through the rest of those on your own. <clears throat> what we will likely do, do uh, in the actual uh, class itself is give you more hands-on experience with assessing uh, an organization's capacity for change. We'll be handing out a, a um, print-based um, uh, assessment uh, for you to have uh, experience in uh, taking the assessment and scoring it. Uh, and if you, you know, if you have an organization that you think of particular, that would be helpful. <clears throat> um, I want to go a little bit further now and talk about uh, the change leadership process. And um, you'll see a slide that's in front of you that says change leadership process. It's, uh, it, has, it shows a three-phase three process. And as you'll see, there's sort of an arrow at the top that calls strategic leadership, and underneath it, it's, it's called operational leadership. Um, I really want to make the distinction for the purposes of our lecture and for this class that I need to define for you what strategic leadership is and operational leadership. Uh, strategic leadership is uh, defined as any activity in that organization uh, that's by the leaders that's focused on 
the positioning of the organization uh, in one year or more. So strategic planning, for example, would be a process uh, that leadership would use to, to examine the organization in any activity over one year. Typically the plans today by uh, organizations are two to three years, uh, even in uh, uh, change uh, aggressive environments or high, uh, low uncertain environments. The operational leadership is any activity uh, by those leaders that is for one year or less. So a budget, for example, would be an operational leadership area uh, that they would be need to be focusing on. So uh, you can see with this three-phase process that leaders are, are consumed and dedicated both to both strategic leadership area and to the operational leadership area. <clears throat> and within that, we have found that what leaders do is when they are looking at improving the or capacity of the organization to, to provide effective stewardship of change, that is building capacity in that organization for change, that they are following a three-step process. They're following an audit, design, and execution. That is, they're gathering information during the audit phase. They're really uh, understanding the basis for making and solving problems, but they really need information. The second is they take that information and what they do is they analyze it and they come out of that with recommendations about what the organization needs to do. And in that design, they're actually also planning. Now this planning is not just on a yearly basis, which is routine for most organizations, but they are now shifting uh, into an increasing amount of uh, activity around um, putting plans in place that are strategic, not waiting for the year, but on a quarterly basis. Uh, that is, they're actually doing strategic planning on a quarterly basis and reaching out with greater frequency to external, pulling in external data and information about what their competitors are doing and not, and not, and because time here is the issue, see. If time is the issue for organizations that are going rapid growth and change and how their leadership should respond, then the real issue is the, if it's time, which I think it is, then it's a real issue of the cycle time of decisions, okay? So the faster the decisions are made that are good decisions is a good thing. So with the design phase, they, they are stepping uh, uh, very forcefully into the planning area and then they're designing it for execution, which is our third, our third area here. That is, they're actually looking at actionable insights. I call it firing with live ammunition. They're actually preparing action plans and getting those out and uh, being very thoughtful about it and attaching the right kinds of information and resources for business optimization. So here's a little bit more. You see some of the slides uh, <coughs> on tools and dimensions. I do believe that the work that uh, we have done and we've been pulling in from others on the port performance dimensions or systems view of the organization can be very helpful to leaders as they go through this process. And, and so uh, we'll be giving that further on here, okay? I don't want to go through these other slides as organizational execution. We talk about those. Now what I like to talk about are the different kinds of um, leaders that we see in organizations uh, as they relate to leaders that are effectively using change as a weapon. Okay, That is, the, we, we've got an expanded view of leaders that I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about now. Okay, And you'll see before you a slide it calls, it's called Strategic and Operational Leadership Styles. And so the leaders that we are finding out today in this world, this global economy, this world of creating capacity for change, that are creating environments and cultures uh, for change, uh, have uh, five particular distinct qualities uh, with them. Uh, you know, and, and, and I want to say that the leaders are focused on all of these areas. A leader is focused on all these areas. They're the strategic leader that we've been talking about. Uh, they also, in terms of this actual lecture, uh, lecture series, it's, we've talked about in terms of leadership as a process. So the process leader is very focused to continuous improvement, improvements uh, uh, throughout the organization. They're also the change leaders we've been talking about. Fourthly, uh, they're the facilitative leader. That is, they are all about facilitating processes in the organization as a champion of those processes. They're actually chartering initiatives throughout the organization to get people involved, dealing with the issue, pushing down authority uh, in the organization along with a requisite responsibility for individuals and they have, the, they, they don't, by the way, delegate accountability because it's, you know, the buck stops wherever they are, there's an old saying. 
uh, but they are involved and engaged in terms of facilitating communications, resources, power uh, to come to a keen, solid, defined awareness of what change is all about. And, la and lastly, we find that leaders are self-leaders, that they are improving themselves uh, before leading others. They're really committed to a uh, lifelong um, um, development of leadership uh, skills and behaviors and practices uh, uh, in this in a, in a era, an era or globalization of complexity within organizations, okay? So what organizations are doing today, today is they, they have learned uh, in the area of change to put change processes up front to diagnose problems. Uh, these leaders are building organizational knowledge and engagement throughout the organization. They're restructuring organizations to build engagement and maintaining organizational focus. You're going to see a lot more, as there has been, an increasing amount of organizations undergoing restructuring uh, as they find their strategies are shifting and being renewed or being replaced. Uh, we know that strategy follows structure, or structure follows strategy, that they are putting in place restructurings of organizations to get it aligned correctly at a structural level to respond to the change requirements that are necessary. Um, always are organizations of any size today are having to enrich platforms for new products and services. That is, they're going to have to be coming out with new products. They're going to have to be thinking about more inventive ways of keeping the customer, not losing them because of poor leadership, excuse me, customer service practices. And that today we're seeing an increased amount of uh, mergers and acquisitions and when you do those, what you really are doing is you're bringing in, uh, you need to, the leaders are focusing on really how to do post-cultural integration of different cultures and how those cultures work together. We, we've become very, uh, much more s deliberate and smart about the early years, 1980s and 1990s, in which a lot of acquisitions were being uh, done, but many of those were falling apart because they could not integrate the different cultures. What you have, uh, what you will see is a, next is a slide uh, uh, called organizational audit. There is uh, the, uh, the eight performant dim the performance dimensions of an organization. And this is what we found is a critical, very high end view and a systems view of all those dimensions that are associated with, with for leaders of building um, uh, organizations that are change friendly uh, change seeking with the capacity, moving in that direction of building the capacity to respond as leaders to, to the organization. It's a, it's a systems view for those elements. And you'll see there, change readiness, continuous learning, customer focus, communications, leadership, which we're talking about here, that is ability to manage vision, values, and strategy, uh, continuous improvement, uh, market focus, and clarity of direction. So the purpose of this lecture is not necessarily to give details in each one of these areas, though we will be talking about it in subsequent sections of the lecture uh, in, in some detail, uh, but, but also to, to, to impress upon you the importance of this area as a systems view in which to hang, if you will, our other analysis and views of how organizations uh, thrive and survive, okay? So as we move on through this, um, you'll see other slides that'll come up and um, there's such things as organizational audit. It'll talk about change leadership practices. Uh, how do you use those results for audits in the organizations and so forth. Uh, one slide as you get further into this is an area called, um, we have characterized as execution strategic uh, ac articulation map. This is a leadership one page summary of the executable plans, one page, for the entire organizations as it relates to change. This document is being used increasingly worldwide by organizations uh, as a one page summary of their whole business plan or strategy. <clears throat> and so uh, we give that to you to give you a better idea of how organizations are summarizing for the purposes of communicating uh, through all their constituents, internal and ex external to the organization, uh, what their vision is, what their mission is, how they differentiate themselves in the marketplace, what their strategic objectives are, what key processes they're using, 
and how are they uh, measuring their success is what we call key performance indicators. So I think that will come down to the end of this uh, session as we talk about um, uh, the change management and change leadership area. Uh, I would encourage you to get into your, uh, to the chapter 13 and read it uh, out of the book and go through it. It just so happens we're putting some of this up front. And by the way, some of what you hear and see here is new. It will not be in the book, um, but it's a supplemental reading to give you a, uh, I guess you will a systems view, a high-end view of how leaders are preparing the organization for change, okay? So we will be carrying on and talking uh, further uh, in, the, in the next lecture and picking up on chapter one.